Americans have gone to the polls and Donald Trump has emerged as the presumptive winner of the presidential race, setting the stage for a return to the White House. A second Trump administration comes with significant implications for the markets and the economy. Joining us now to break it all down is TD Chief Economist Beata Currency and TD Asset Management's Chief Investment Officer David Sykes. Thanks so much for joining us on what's a pretty significant day, uh, not only for the history of books, but obviously for the economy and the markets. It's great to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. So how should we jump in? Let's, uh, obviously we went into what we thought was a very tough race. So some of us uh, hung in as long as we could before we uh, you know, looked at our phones in the early hours of the morning and started to figure out what was going on. It'll be out of right out of the gate. What, what's your reaction to this? Um, I think overall pleased in, in the sense that there's um, a clear, it looks like there's a clear cut winner on the presidential side and um, as well as within the Senate. And so the outstanding factor at this time remains the House. Um, but you can see the market reaction was clear. Uh, we're not going to hopefully be stuck in weeks of judicial reviews or anything to that extent. So from that perspective, positive that, um, that the, the, you know, the answer was clear. Um, ultimately, markets have come up quite a bit. There was a strong equity rally. The U.S. dollar has gone up, but so have yields. Um, and so there's a general sense that we will be in a higher inflation, higher fiscal deficit environment. Uh, in the U.S., but also the Canadian yields have imported about half the move of what we're seeing on the U.S. side. So we are in a higher yield environment as a result. So that's the net negative versus the positive happening on the equity markets that you were talking about. Now, let's talk about that, David, because obviously, I mean, as Beata was saying, we have clarity to a large degree. We'll figure out the house, but we seem to know where we're headed and the markets have rallied pretty strongly. I don't know if I mentioned the Russell 2000, the, uh, the small and mid caps, but more than almost 5%. I mean, what, this is one day of action, but what's going on here? Yeah, so I think if you think about capital markets, if you think about currency markets, uh, fixed income markets, to me, it's a very rational response. Um, I think last night was important in the sense that it's over. We have the answer. Yes, we don't have the House just yet. Senate, clearly Republican. We know who the occupier of the Oval Office is going to be. And we also have a very clear roadmap what that occupier wants to do. There's no question that he would like to keep the 2017 tax cuts in place. Um, that's you know, probably something that's, I think, relatively easy if he gets the House. We'll see how that plays out. But from the market's perspective, look, the same tax rates, corporate tax rates are not going up. You're going to have you know, the same consumer tax rates that we have. That's a market positive. It's good for profits. It's good for the bottom line. And I think that's a big part of the move. But it's not just on the equity side. It's really those small caps, those smaller companies who've been really struggling with the weight of higher rates. And now you know, the certainty that their taxes aren't going to be going up, that's a really positive move you're seeing. I think on the fixed income side, you know, Beata hit something. The U.S. 10-year Treasury is up about 20 basis points. I'm not quite sure I can point to one thing and say, well, it's because it's pro-inflationary policies. I think this is a pro-growth agenda for sure from Trump. I think there's concerns about the debt and the deficit. I think there's also concern with bond vigilantes and how much debt can we take. But you know, you've clearly seen a move higher. And then on the US dollar, it's had a huge move higher and everything else is basically negative. You know, whether you're looking at Canadian dollar, you're looking at peso, euro, everything is trading down. But I do think this is an environment where if you look at the positives from tax, and then I forgot to mention deregulation. I mean, this is a clear, clear area that Trump focuses on. There has been so much regulation on energy companies, on financials during the Biden administration. This is clearly going to be top of the agenda. And this is going to be clearly positive for the bottom line. It's also going to be positive for capital markets activity. You're going to see more mergers and acquisitions. You're going to see more action uh, in capital markets. And I think that's the resounding response today from the market, which you know, it's very rational. It's, a, it's people sort of surprised because I think sometimes Trump, you know, let's just say he's not mainstream with his words, but certainly if you look at what matters to the equity market, the currency market, and the fixed income markets, these are positive. Maybe not perhaps a fixed income market, but it is a pro-growth strategy. Now, David, you mentioned the fact that obviously in Beata that we have some clarity on this. We woke up in the morning and we knew. And so then you start to know what policy looks like. Let's talk about that policy. Let's talk about a Trump administration 2.0. Uh, tariffs seem to be high on yeah. the agenda. This is our largest trading partner. What do we need to be worried about, worried about there, Beata? Or, or just cognizant of? Yeah, well, I think from a Canadian perspective, obviously, we're worried about, uh, he's, he's made statements about blanket 10% tariffs, going as high as 20% tariffs on countries, with uh, China potentially as high as 60%. So that's the statement. Um, if the administration were to do that right out of the gate, it would be quite disruptive as well for American supply chains and for consumer prices. So the general view is that he will absolutely do tariffs. He may have to pick and choose which countries. China is at the top of the priority list. 
Canada is not necessarily in that top 10 list right away for 2025 because we do have the USMCA coming up for review in 2026. And so that's the pathway and avenue to have more targeted. So we may be, you know, maybe pushed to the side. That's the hope. We'll see. Um, with more focus happening on uh, Mexico, Europe, and China. And the reason I say Mexico, even though we have the USMCA coming up, which includes Mexico, is because uh, Mexico has uh, been commented on via their pathway of Chinese products getting into the US via Latin America. So um, he may not give them as much leeway as perhaps we, we hope to see on the Canadian side. Hopefully that's not you know, home country bias coming out of me <laughs> in terms of the exclusion. But at the end of the day, we should, if, we should expect regardless um, an environment with higher tariffs, uh, trade flows getting impacted globally. So typically when you have the tariffs put on countries, you have um, an immediate knee jerk reaction of less exports. Over time, when you get about a year out, you see companies are extremely adaptable. They look for other supply chains, they look for product substitution, they develop domestic markets. Uh, so this is the industrial policy side of the intent of why they're doing tariffs is to bring some of this production home and or level the playing field on tariffs. So I think they will succeed on that front and I think Trump and the administration will be quite clear on this intent. Um, the one aspect that could be positive for Canada is that we, we are too reactionary to US policy as opposed to thinking through our business competitive position on the global stage. And my hope is that with what we're seeing and are about to see out of the US, that we have government policies really pivot to thinking deeply about what needs to be done from a tax code perspective, from um, um, you know, investment policies, subsidies, whatever it takes, to really make sure we're a bit more insulated from whoever becomes president of the United States from impacting our competitiveness. Really a, you know, a standalone policy just to be competitive, period. Um, we've written a lot on this, that Canada is doing really poorly in productivity and investment. So this is an opportunity, if they want to see it as such, to hopefully get public buy-in that we really need to turn the dial here on um, corporate competitiveness in this country. David, when I think of what Beata has been saying and the possible economic implications for us on both the good and, and the bad side, when I think about the rally we're seeing in the States for the reasons that you so nicely laid out, is this a U.S. stock story? Can it be a Canadian stock story? Well, will their boat lift our boat as well when it comes to our equity markets? Yeah, I think there's an element of that for sure, but I think we have to be careful. You know, we've just, we've just, it's the, it's the day after the election. Yeah, like, <laughs> so, it, we're you know, in the hours to, to, to after make, we finally make, woke up. And to make ground, yeah. grand pronouncements yeah. about what's going to happen in the next two, three, four years, that's, that's yeah. difficult. And I would say, you know, a little bit intellectually arrogant if we think we can pinpoint that. But from my standpoint, I think the tariff issue is the real one, and that can be inflationary, uh, clearly not good for our growth in this country. I would just say, though, if, you, if you've watched Trump in the past, you know, this is a bit of a tool that he uses to negotiate. And I think the big one that I would be concerned about is the 60% tariff on China. Um, you know, we don't know the House composition yet, but the one thing we do know is with executive orders, Trump can do quite a few things around tariffs and trade. And so, you know, is that going to be a negotiating tool against China? Will it be 60%? I think Europe is clearly in his sights. I think Mexico is absolutely in his sights. So we'll have to see. But clearly, you know, if we get into a a tariff placed by Trump uh, on Chinese goods or Mexican goods, and there's a retaliatory nature to that, that's the situation we don't want to see. That's going to be clearly inflationary, and that'll be negative for growth. But the other thing that you know, Trump, I think, on the negative side here is he's talked very openly about how he views immigration. And he looks at that Mexican border uh, as a national security issue. And so I think one of the issues we have to really delve into is, is it just bluster or is he, is he very serious when he talks about deportation of a million immigrants? Uh, you know, what are they going to do? If he does something like that, I do think you have to realize that's going to shrink his labor supply. Could mean higher wages, again, inflationary. But again, it's early hours. I think, I think the, the best thing we can do at the moment is wait for the return for the House, see what that composition is. But I do clearly feel that uh, for, you know, from a bond market standpoint, you know, this is a little more uh, fiscal expansion, a, a little more um, budget deficit uh, unfriendly. But on the equity side, this is very pro-growth. And this is something that I think equities are going to respond to, particularly those smaller caps that I talked about. Because for a lot of those companies, this is just a great sign. And they're up 2 to 3x with the broader markets up.